Good evening and welcome to the CIC. Today we have a very interesting session. Ravi Chellam is going to talk to us about the conservation of lions. And I hope in the course of the discussion, we would also get to hear about the latest controversy on the cheetahs. To introduce Ravi Chellam, he is a wildlife biologist and conservation scientist who has been involved with research, education, outreach and conservation of biodiversity since the early 80s. In his career, he has worked with many institutions including the World Wildlife Institute of India, the United Nations Development Programme, Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment, Wildlife Conservation Society, India Programme, the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust, Foundation for Ecological Security and Greenpeace India. Many of these in leadership positions. He studied the Asiatic lions in Gir Forest for his PhD and has been involved with research and conservation of lions since 1985. His work includes field research surveys and preparing a plan to translocate and establish a second population of free-ranging lions in India. He served as an expert scientific advisor to the forest bench of the Supreme Court of India in 2012. For about a decade, he was the research coordinator of WII. He has been involved in governance roles with several NGOs. He teaches at several institutions, including the National Center for Biological Sciences, TIFR. He has published extensively, both academically as well as in more publicly accessible media. He works closely with the government on policy matters and has served on a few government committees and has given several, more than 450, in fact, academic and public talks. He is currently CEO of MetaSting Foundation, coordinator of the Biodiversity Collaborative and is closely involved with the development of the National Mission on Biodiversity and Human Well-Being. Welcome, Mr. Ravi. Please join us here. In conversation with him would be Mahati. She is a final year student of Azim Premji University pursuing an undergraduate degree in physics. She works with biodiversity documentation and nature awareness with a focus on birds, butterflies and moths. She is also the founder of the Chennai Young Naturalist Network and is also an editor for its annual e-magazine Nature Trail. She is a member of the Madras Naturalist Society. Welcome Mati, please join us here. So with that, I hand over the proceedings to Ravi. Over to you, Ravi. So I thought I will talk both about its ecology as well as its conservation. Um, I got into research to do conservation. I'm not a great academic. I don't claim to be pushing the boundaries of knowledge. I like to translate science into action. And that's the role I've tried to play through my career. Most pictures of Asiatic lines from gear will show us animals by the road, with people, from tourists. And the time when I started work, I had a problem. Most people had negative things to say about the animal. It's not wild, it's domesticated. The true wildlife of India is tiger. And as it would have it in 72, the national animal, which was the Asiatic lion since independence, got changed to the tiger. So there was also this justification saying, see, it was not good enough. That's how the tiger became the national animal. The fact is, the real reason given was lions are found only in one state, while tigers are found in 18 states of India. So much more representative of uh, the country. So at least that's the way it was presented. So I'm going to really show pictures to tell you what is unique about them, what is special about them, what is wild about them, so that you can form your own opinions. Lions are special. The only species of large cats or of cats which are social. No other cats are social. Lions are also special because they're sexually dimorphic. From a distance, you can make out a male from a female. So this, this is a male lion, the first one is a pair of cubs. And as you can see, Young cubs, lion cubs are also coming with markings. Uh, these markings disappear when they grow to be about four, five, six months old. So that's an adult male. 
This is a subadult male. You can see the mane is not fully grown. And this is again an adult male. Uh, since lions occur in India and Africa, one of the questions that's often asked about me is how do you know what is an Asian lion and what's an African lion? And half jokingly, I say, if you see a lion in Africa, it's an African lion. If you see a lion in Gir, it's Asian. Because it is not easy to make out the difference from external morphological characteristics. One thing, though, this fold of skin is called a belly fold. All Asian lions have a belly fold. But the matter is complicated because about 50% of the African lions also have a belly fold. So the absence of a belly fold tells you it's African. The presence doesn't tell you whether it's Asian or African. This by far is the most handsome Asiatic male lion I have seen. Uh, I mean, this is a picture one of my friends Manoj Dolakya took recently. And this is just fantastic. I mean, tell me what is wrong with this animal? Why should you compare it saying it's not wild, it's not beautiful, it's not charismatic? And now the latest battle, of course, as Mr. Chandramali said, is with the cheetah. That the African cheetah is more charismatic than the Asian lion. We'll get to it later. These are also special animals because if you're brought up on a diet of nat National Geographic and Discovery Animal Planet like that, you will only see lions and grasslands in open habitats. These are forest dwelling animals. Okay. And lions have historically lived right across the length and breadth of Africa. In, and today they live in deserts. Kalahari in Namibia has lions. The Atlas Mountains in Morocco used to have lions. So lions like tigers can span and live across a wide range of habitats. This, of course, is the lioness, and you can clearly see the difference between a male and a female. And even here, you can see the belly fold. More pictures just to convey what I think are magnificent animals. Here's a lioness with a couple of cubs, tending to be about four or five months old. More lioness and three cubs here, younger cubs. And here you see two male lions resting during the heat of the afternoon in a dry river bed under a sh shady tree. And you can see in the case of the lion in the back, he's swishing his tail. When cats swish their tail, it's not like a dog wagging its tail. It's the completely opposite message that the cat is giving. Uh, it is not a sign of friendliness. It's a sign of irritation, incipient aggression. So these are things that we need to pick up when we're doing our work. Almost all my work was done on foot. And most of these pictures were also taken um, using, uh, in those days, I the uh, biggest uh, lens I had was a 135 mm. And those who know photography know what that means in terms of distance. Of course, not all pictures are mine. Uh, several of my photographer's friends have also contributed. As I said, lines are social. Here you see a photograph of a male, a female, and two cubs. And most people will come to the conclusion, oh, that's a nice family, appa, amma and son and daughter or whatever. But the lion society does not work like that. And I will tell you in a bit and explain how lion society works. This is a very unusual picture from Gir. Uh, I don't remember very many sightings where males and females are seen together. Of course, you'll see them when they are mating, but otherwise females will be seen with their young and other related females, males have their own lives. Social as in living in groups. Social as in living in groups. No cat lives in a group. They are solitary animals. Like primates live in troops. Elephants live in herds. Deer live in herds. Antelope live in herds. But large cats are solitary animals. In the wild dog family, several of them are also pack living. But So that's kind of unique for large cats. And to have a social large cat, is an absolute uh, uh, different thing. And there are good ecological reasons as to why uh, lions have developed sociality. This is the core of lions society. This is the pride. We often use pride as a collective noun for lions, but prides don't have males. This is the pride. A bunch of related females constitute a pride. So. You will have sisters, mothers, grandmothers, aunts, and that kind of constellation. And obviously, you can see the oldest of the animals are right at the back. And then there's a gradation of ages 
from the body size you can make out. And I will later on talk to you about, obviously this group cannot keep growing endlessly. At some point of time, animals have to move out. I mean, you can't have a 500 uh, member pride. Uh, the biggest prides, I think, when females have given young uh, to cubs is in the region of 30, 40 animals. But typically, in a pride, you would see them in the size of between four to eight animals. And prides, even though they might number 20 or 25, you seldom will see all the lines together. They will split, you come together and things like that. So the males, I mean, the males are there, but their role is different. They don't constitute the core of the pride. And males live in groups also, and they are called coalitions, male coalitions. And male coalitions can range in size from two to seven. Seven is very unusual. It's more normal to have them in size of two or three animals. Lions evolved in Africa and through a process of natural dispersal actually occupied all of this region. And today in Asia, we have a relict population of lions in Gir Forest, Saurashtra Peninsula of Gujarat. Till fairly recently, the Asiatic lion used to be called Panthera leo persica. <coughs> Recent genetic studies have shown that there are only two subspecies of lions, Panthera leo leo, which is found in West Africa, Central Africa, and in Gir, and Panthera leo melanochaita, which is in Eastern and Southern Africa. And this is a map reconstructing using hunting, shikar, and historical records. And you can see, again, the distribution in Asia and in India as far east as Bihar and as far south as the Narmada River. More recent research has shown that lions actually had a wider distribution further east of this dot and further south of this dot. I need to update this map. But today, the only population is here. And from this reconstruction and from historical record, I can tell you that soldiers on horseback from Red Fort went and killed lions in what is today Delhi airport, Palam. In Palam, lions have been hunted. And on horseback, how far can you go? So this tells you the tragedy that the lions have faced. And of course, the cheetahs in India faced a bigger tragedy because they became extinct. The advent of the firearm. So in the 1800s, the early 1800s, much of North and Central India had lions. By 1888, so in eight decades, lions were obliterated from rest of India and only Saurashtra was left with lions. Firearms. Why the tigers and leopards survive better? They are not social. So if you see one lion, you see many lions. You shoot one lion, you can shoot many lions. If you shoot a tiger or a leopard, at best you can shoot one. Second, lions can't keep their mouth shut. They roar regularly. So if you don't see them, you hear them. And third, lions occur in more open, accessible habitats. So more open habitat, more flatter land. It's easier for you to access those animals. Don't focus on the accuracy of the numbers. Just look at the trend. What this tells you is 1880, 1913, very nearly went extinct. So this is something what India really needs to be proud about. We should congratulate ourselves that unlike many other countries, we have not only prevented extinction, but the lion population has actually rebounded quite significantly. The, as I said, don't focus on the accuracy, but just look at the trend. Now, this is a more recent set of counts you have. And today, the most recent estimate from 2020 is 674. But by all accounts, they say at least 700 lines. So it's been a general increasing trend in the population. The other thing you need to focus on on these yellow bars, which have these in thousands square kilometers, the area over which lines are occurring. This is a map of the protected area. The central dark green has a national park status. The surrounding light green has a wildlife sanctuary status. All of it put together is only 1600 square kilometers. So today lions are found in 30,000 square kilometers of which only 1600 has the status of a protected area. So what do the remaining 28,400 square kilometers? It's your backyard, my front yard, it's somebody's farmland, it's a railway station, bus stand, highways. That's the kind of habitat in which lions are found today. Quick peek into what the forest looks like. It's not flat. It's undulating series of low hills. 
And when you go into the forest, this is what it looks like. Hardly grassland or savanna. It's dry deciduous forest. The far eastern part of Gir gets much less a rainfall. The west gets about 900. The east gets only about 650. And this resembles a more savanna, East African kind of open forest. There are seven perennial rivers draining the forest. And they are the lifeline for wildlife. Because monsoon is kind of, if, if it comes, is from about mid-June till end of September. And rest of the year, there's hardly any rain. Summer temperatures can reach 47 degrees centigrade. So it's extremely hot. But monsoon is also magical. It just transforms the forest in no time. Uh, I mean, this is a picture that I took in the monsoon season of 87, I think. And this is just one week into the monsoon. Because if the plants recognize water is a scarce uh, resource, and once the water comes, the plants put forth their foliage. As I said, lions are forest dwelling. And this is a picture that only you can get from India because it's a banyan tree under which that pride is resting. Lions are not the only large cat. If you didn't see it, you see the leopard there. Le there's a very thriving, large population of leopards in Gir. And the only reason lions and leopards are able to coexist is because of this ability of the leopard to climb a tree. If a lion catches a leopard on the ground, leopard is dead. Uh, they don't like each other. But the leopard, being less than half the size of an adult lion, can't do very much about it. It's not just wildlife. There are also people. That's the magic of India, that wildlife and people have found ways to live together. I mean, of course, our religions have some role to play. Our culture has some role to play. Our official approach to conservation has some role to play. It's a combination of all these factors, the historical, the cultural, and the immediate more scientific interventions that's enabled this to happen. These are the Maldaris. They essentially graze buffaloes uh, in the forest. And uh, then the produce of the buffalo becomes their product of commerce. They live in very primitive thorn enclosed settlements called a nest. And the thorns are basically to keep the lions and leopards away. And at least in the 80s, uh, there was no electricity, everything had to be done manually. And here, it's very early morning shot, something like 4 o'clock, extremely hospitable, friendly people. And uh, the milk gets converted to yogurt and to butter and then to ghee. Ghee gets transported every week or 10 days to the market. In more recent times, I'm told that refrigerated trucks come in and take liquid milk out. So their economy in that sense is much better now. The prey species, lions are uh, carnivore, they need prey species. Cheetal, the most common, uh, most abundant uh, prey species. Sambar, not so abundant, but the preferred prey species. Sambar is about three times the size of cheetal. So for a per unit effort, you get much more return in terms of food. That's a well-fed lion. I mean, I'm saying that because can you see that bulging side? Um, and the tools of the trade here, essentially the canine teeth. There are two in the lower jaw, two in the upper jaw. And those teeth are very essential to be able to kill the prey. The four legs have much bigger paws than the rear legs. And those claws and these teeth are the killing instruments. And this is what they can do to a prey animal. Two male lions kill this cheetal stag something like 4.30 in the morning. I was tracking them so I know that. So I go in at dawn, which is roughly around 7 o'clock. Both of them had fed it completely, chewed it up, and only the skeletal remains are left. And that's the other part of the skeleton. Just to tell you how efficient predators these are. That they are wild and they are not domestic. Close-up pictures of them feeding. The canines are useful to kill. The canines are useless to eat. You can't use your canine teeth to eat. So they have to, as you can see, apply modified molar, which are like cutting knives. So they have no fork or knife. So they have to get the meat off the carcass. And they just cut and swallow chunks. They don't chew their food. It's, it's meat anyway, and the digestive system takes care of it. And this is a good way to look at the size of those paws. And these paws are right now re not retract, I mean retracted. They can expand it at least 50% that size. More pictures of them feeding. And here is a pride on a cheetal kill. If you look carefully, you can see the cheetal leg sticking out there. And this is a single female lion having killed a big Nilgai bull. 
This female is radio collared. If you look carefully, you can look at that. You can find that collar there. So I knew her weight. She was about 110 kilos. And this Nilgai bull would have weighed roughly 300 kilos. And she was able to handle that on her own. They also kill livestock. Livestock isn't part of their lives. It's part of their landscape. They're not going to say, oh, Ravi owns this buffalo, so I'm not going to kill. I mean, if they get the opportunity, they'll kill whatever comes their way. And this is a photograph taken outside the forest. Outside the forest, bulk of what they get to eat is livestock. They're, they can get the occasional nil guy, the occasional wild pig, but primarily they have to depend on livestock. Of the population of about 700 lions, 50%, about 350 are not within the forest. They are outside the forest. So we talked about the social unit, a pride, being related females and their dependent offspring and coalition of males being two to seven males and typically the males are unrelated to the females and for good reason if they're related they'll be in breeding so that's that's the way their society works a couple of males sleeping under a banyan tree this is a three members of a five male coalition i studied one of them was radio collared and just to give you a kind of a sense of how they grow from a few months to little over a year to about three and a half four years which is when the males have to leave their pride they will be kicked out if, if they don't get the message the mother aunts everybody is going to come and constantly harass them so that they get the message uh, males entering reproductive age are not allowed to stay in the pride in which they are born for good reason Otherwise, they'll start mating with their mothers, brothers, I mean, sisters, aunts. I mean, they don't know, right? So that's the way it works. So once they leave the pride, the males have a fairly difficult life because they're homeless. They're roaming around trying to figure out whether there are older males they can attack and push off and take over a pride. If they're a lone male, then they have a bigger problem. They first have to find another partner before they can form a coalition. Sometimes from a pride, you can have two, three, four males dispersing at the same time. Then they already have the numbers to move out. And typically leaving their pride in which they are born, they will spend between 18 months to three years before they are able to gain a new territory and access to a pride. And their tenure in a pride is restricted. As they grow older, the next generation of young males will come and push them out. So, adult males are lucky to survive till about 12 years of age. Females can live till about 18 because adult males have to constantly fight. And when you fight, you pick up injuries. So, to schematically represent that, what happens? Females are born at the age of about three or four. They have two choices. They either get integrated into the pride of birth or leave. The number of females leaving the pride is much lesser than the males because all males have to leave. Then they get into the reproductive phase for about eight years. And maximum wild age is 18. In captivity, they can live longer. When you look at males, it's slightly different. At about three years, they have to leave the pride, then they have to form a coalition. And then if they are lucky, they establish their territory. And that territory they enjoy only for two or three years. And then they are pushed off and then they are nomadic again. So there are two phases of nomadism once they leave their pride and once they are ousted from their territory. And as I said, they are lucky to live till about 12 years. I told you that lions Males and females are not seen together. Obviously, you have to see them together if they are mating. And this is a good sign. Here, the male is testing whether she is available. And this behavior is called flemen. If there are students of zoology, they'll know that. And there's another indication when a male guards a female so closely, because there are other males around, you female is a scarce resource. So the male will really hang close by the female. The mating of lions is a fairly loud and raucous affair. The first day is kind of getting to know each other. The second, third day, fourth day is when bulk of the mating takes place and they can mate as often as three or four times every hour. And you can see 
I mean, I don't have to speak to these pictures. You can, you can see the kind of behavior that they are exhibiting. And it's for good reason. You see the size difference, how much bigger the male is compared to the female. So as soon as the copulation is over, she will growl at him, turn back and try and slap him on his face if he doesn't move. G gestation period is about 110 days and you can see distinctly 50% of the cubs are born during summer. Again, good reason. During summer, water is restricted. When water is restricted, prey tends to congregate around water holes, making it easier for females to hunt. And lions are social, so that not every mother has to go and hunt. One mother can stay back to look after the entire bunch of cubs. They also try to coordinate their breeding so that all cubs are born in a reasonably short frame of time. So average litter size is between two and three. We have data. This is my PhD student's data. 10 litters, 23 were the total number of cubs. So you get that. But they are clearly cubs being born throughout the year. Lions also practice what is called as infanticide. And this happens when the territorial male gets ousted. The incoming males have no investment in the cubs. These cubs are fathered by other males. So since their tenure is short, they don't want to waste time looking after uh, cubs belonging to the previous set of males. And also when females are lactating, they are not available for mating. So this killing serves two purposes. You make sure your females are available during the two, three years that you're there and you're investing in cubs that you have contributed to. It is normal for 50% of the cubs to die. There's nothing unusual about it. That's the way nature is. You can't have every single cub surviving, then you will have a uh, problem. Infanticide is, was recorded first in Africa. It's now been recorded in India also. But this is unusual. That, that one year in 2002, 2003, when Meena was doing her PhD work, this, this high percentage, that's unusual. Male lions will carry injuries, not necessarily merely from mating, but a lot of these are because you're fighting the neighboring uh, male. And the main job of the male is to patrol. And in Gir, because you have so many wonderful roads, they have chosen to use the roads uh, rather than wa walk through vegetation with thorns and all of that. And it made my life easy. So I could track them. Their pug marks would be on the ground and it made it easier for me to track. What are they defending? They're basically defending females and the cubs. Males have two kinds of visiting cards. One is roaring. A roaring is a short duration, long distance visiting card on a still day. Lion roars can be heard as far as three or four kilometers. And especially if the lion is on top of a hill and you're down, that distance can even go higher. And this signal means two things. For fellow coalition members, it's saying, hi, I'm here, nothing to worry. I'm, I'm doing fine. For neighboring males, don't come and mess with me. I'm active. If you step in, you will have a price to pay. And that also is a signal to the females saying you're going to be well looked after. The other visiting card they have is a short distance but longer lasting visiting card and it's based on chemicals. And this is the scent marking. So when lions are patrolling every 10, 15, 20 meters, they look for a tree which is like this or a rock which is slightly shaded because if direct sunlight comes, if rain comes, they'll wash away the scent mark. These scents can last for a week or more. So they typically have to keep coming and circling. And this is again, all lines can recognize each other based on their scent. So that's why I call them a visiting card. They can recognize each other's voice. They can recognize each other's scent. Like tigers, do they also scratch? Uh, not so much. Not so much. I mean, they do. But the marking function is primarily roaring and scent marking. The... Scratching is more to maintain their claws. If there are bits of meat and things like that buried under the, under the claws, when they scratch through it, that comes out. Because there are not so many scent glands through which you can apply your scent while scratching a tree. Dr. A.J.T. Johnson, India's first trained wildlife biologist. There's a strong Tamil connection. I mean, he's from Nangan area. I'm from Tirunelveli. Meena is from Madras. So, you know, there's a generation of people who studied lines from Tamil Nadu. And that's me, believe it or not, 1987. And this is uh, one of our uh, tranquilized radio collared animals. And that's the radio collar for those who are not familiar. Why do we radio collar animals? To enable us to efficiently track them. 
try go on looking for any wild animal without any aid. It's almost impossible. Not only to find them, but second to recognize them. How do you know it's the same animal you looked at yesterday? Radio collar solves that problem for us. It sends us regular signals, you're able to track them, and you know each caller's frequency, so the identity is not, never in doubt. Pretty primitive uh, at that point of time. I mean, you can see a typical charpoy top. That was the stretcher we were using. After radio collaring, we would weigh the animal and then allow it to recover. I would be left behind to monitor its recovery. A lot of human resources was required to make all this happen. Once the animal is radio collared, the onus is on the researcher to go and get data. Nowadays, a lot of it is happening based on satellite, GPS, those kind of things. But I still feel terrestrial tracking gives you an insight into the animal's life that just a location on a map will not do. I think you need to do a combination of both. And that's me on top of a hill because you can get reception of radio signals much better when you're at an elevated space. And what does the data tell us? So here you see how the data is mapped. So this is where the animal is born, then it dispersed here, then it moved here for some time, then it moved here. None of this reconstruction or understanding is possible without a radio call. And here, a, much, a lot more data, 174, lo uh, no, 302 locations. It tells you that this male's territory is 174 square kilometers. As I said, lions today, live a lot outside the protected area. This is the gear forest, but lions are found through this entire region of 30,000 square kilometers. And this is a 2015 census. These are official figures. So you can see 304 are only in the forest. Rest of them are outside. And what does that mean? Here you see two villages. They probably don't even know a lioness is sleeping by the road. And lions have to constantly deal with rail and road traffic. Almost every year, a few lions are knocked down by trains, trucks, buses, electrocuted, fall into wells, all kinds of things happen. This is a thing that I try and engage all audiences with because all of us have our own understanding and motivation for conservation. I don't know whether all of us spend any time thinking about what conservation is, what conservation means, what kind of conservation should we be doing, should we be thinking, or should we be supporting? So the quest, these are essentially questions I would like you to think about. Is conservation about conserving an individual animal? Or is it about conserving populations of animals? Or is it about ensuring that populations persist? And not just population, but functional ecosystem. You can't have a, a, a population of lions without prey species, without vegetation, without the water that it required, and a whole series of other ecosystem uh, functions that are required. Can animals, wildlife survive without habitats? Can they survive in isolated habitats? So is conservation having to look at habitats and connectivity? What time frames do we plan? I mean, companies have to report every quarter, elections are held every four or five, six years at best. But in conservation, what kind of time frames do we need to think about? What about rights? In India with 1.3, 1.4 billion people, can we do conservation by denying rights to people? People who've been living there much before much of our laws were even enunciated, our policies were enunciated. And today we do have the Forest Rights Act. What about aspects of justice? What about aspects of inclusiveness? Who decides for whom? That can be a broader question in governance, but it's definitely a question in conservation. Are there costs to conservation? Not just financial, there are a whole host of other costs. And if there are costs, who bears these costs? And if there are benefits, who reaps these benefits? These are news reports from the last few years. This is from the 12th of June, 2020, which means 1st of January to 31st of May, 92 lions had died. And of those 92, half of those deaths were due to diseases. And subsequently, this is now March 21. So in two years, 313 lines have died in Gujarat. And this where? It's told in the assembly. So I'm assuming it's a fact. Why do I bring this up? Simply because Gujarat has been adamant in not complying with the Supreme Court order.
I'll get get into those details, but I just wanted to make sure that you know the context in which I'm going to be talking about. This is the Kuno River. Kuno has been in the news more recently because of our Namibian friends having come, the cheetahs I'm talking about. This is the Kuno River, a major perennial tributary of the Chamba. Wonderful place. I mean, I first went there in 93 December. Just, just to give you a sense of what the river looks like, what the habitat looks like. It's a mixture of uh, dry deciduous forest undulating and very diverse. These are bamboo banks, fairly protective grasslands. When we went there, we did our survey between 93 and end of 94, over 12 months. There were a lot of problems. They were overgrazing cattle and so on and so forth. But the forest, the then wildlife sanctuary was about 400 odd square kilometers, but it was set in a forest tract of about 3,500 square kilometers. In India, to find that kind of forest tract is very, very difficult. So that was the reason when I gave the recommendations to Government of India on 25th January 1995, Kuno was the only choice for translocating lions. Why do we need to translocate lions? As I showed from numbers, from a less than 12, 20 to have reached 700 lions is definitely a success story. But all your eggs are in one basket. And risks are very high. I mean, many of you in your professional lives would deal with risk in one way or the other. And to have, and in conservation science, it's very clear. You cannot have the entire population of an endangered species at a single site. So this government started investing from 1995, 1st of April 1995. Crores of rupees were spent, but till 2006, nothing was happening because Gujarat kept saying, these are Gujarati lions, these are family members, we cannot let go, blah, blah, blah. So some public spirited citizen went to court, filed a public interest litigation, and the judgment finally came on 15th of April, 2013. In 2012, I got a phone call asking me to serve as an expert advisor to the forest bench of the Supreme Court. So here I was living in Bangalore almost every week having to travel at my own cost to Delhi to give the advice to the Supreme Court. But the order was noteworthy. It basically said, forget about all your arguments, translocate lines in letter and spirit from Gir to Kuno within six months. No more arguments, do it. 15th of April, six months was 14th of October, 2013. 14th of October is two weeks away in 22, and lions haven't moved one inch. It's a very nuanced judgment. It's only about 45, 50 pages. Draws upon constitutional principles, talks very clearly, very logically, explains the role of each of our constitutional bodies, the National Wildlife Board, the National Action Plan, and so on and so forth. But I do want to spend a few minutes talking about exact text from the judgment. It says... No state, organization, or person can claim ownership or possession over wild animals in the forest. Animals in the wild are properties of the nation for which no state can claim ownership. The state duty is to protect the wildlife and conserve it for ensuring the ecological and environmental security of the country. Preservation of an endangered species for which we have to apply the species best interest standard. So what we think, what we like doesn't matter. What is good for the species is what you should be thinking. And it also said... Because the MOEF had by then wanted to move getting African cheetahs, it said the order of the MOEF to introduce African cheetahs into Kuno cannot stand in the eye of law and the same is quashed. This is 2013 April. What has happened? Currently, it's definitely in a stalemate. The court ordered the formation of an expert committee. This was finally formed in July of 2013. I'm a member of that. The tragedy is this committee has not even met after December 2016. Gujarat is continuing to behave badly and it throws various things like IUCN guidelines, which none of it actually is logical. Is Kono ready? Clearly it's ready. 24 villages were moved out. More than 1,500 families were moved out. The prey base has in increased tremendously. The management capacity has in increased tremendously. Since no action was taking place in 2016, another public spirited citizen filed a contempt petition in the Supreme Court. The court took its time, started hearing it in November 2017. In March 2018, without giving any reason, this contempt petition was also dismissed. I'm told that in court, the government said, next week, we'll hold a meeting. That was in March 2018. And that week is still to come. 
we've still not had that meeting. Now, I told you about de-risking. The Serengeti Mara system in Tanzania and Kenya is the largest lion population. It's about 3,000 lions. In 1994, there was a breakout of canine distemper virus and babesiosis. 1,000 lions died in three weeks' time. We don't even have 1,000 lions here. When this was told to Gujarat, they said, oh, those are all African lions. No, our lions are all great. Nothing will happen and so on. And then in 2018, we had canine distemper virus. According to official records, 36 lions died. I know for a fact, at least 100 lions died. And lions continue to die. You saw those numbers. You saw that disease was an important cause of those mortality. While the government hasn't moved with lion translocation, it filed a review petition against the cheetah order. The Supreme Court gave a kind of murky judgment in January of 2020. Not clear when I say murky. And since then, the case has not been heard, but the government has moved forward. And as you all know, two weeks ago, cheetahs have arrived in Kuno. To me now, today, it's really a question of respect of law. Does Indian society respect rule of law? Does it want rule of law to be applied? That really is the question. The science, the conservation, all of that has been argued threadbare in the 2013 order. So there's no point in revisiting that. And that's why I'm really kind of flummoxed, upset in the manner in which Gujarat government has been talking IUCN, IUCN, IUCN. What does the IUCN tell us? It recommends studies in a general sense, not mandatory preconditions, which is the way go government of Gujarat is looking at it. And there are two phases to the IUCN guidelines. One, the feasibility analysis, and the other, it's about implementation. Clearly, the court has decided it's feasible. So there's no point in revisiting the feasibility. We should only use the guidelines to guide our implementation. So, as I said, the court very categorically, if, if, it, if it is not feasible, how will they order it to translocate within six months? You can't be doing studies as well as translocate lines within six months. So, I am convinced it's completely wrong on the part of government of Gujarat and government of India should have long challenged this. But you know the reasons why it's not probably being challenged. A few slides to conclude. This is also how conservation happens in India. This is Tumkur Engineering College. That's a leopard falling down from its terrace, three or four floors above. Nature, wildlife are intersecting on a daily basis in our lives, like in no other country, and not just snakes and birds. I mean, large mammals like elephants, leopards also. Sometimes people do take law onto their hands. This is from Assam. But even, this is from Karnataka, even when there's a dead leopard, look at, the manner in which the old woman is relating to it, and the curiosity of the young ones around, you know, watching what's happening. And these are the value systems that I think are crucial for us to be able to conserve and allow wildlife to persist. This is my first photograph of a lion, December of 1985. I grew up in Madras, so my knowledge of Hindi wasn't great. And they, there they speak Katiawadi, which is a dialect of uh, Gujarati. And... Uh, I was sent from the Wildlife Institute saying, go explore, see how you can start your field work. Four days walking around, driving around, I saw lion tracks, I, I saw lion kills, I saw lion droppings, I heard them roar at night, but I was not seeing any lions and I was getting a little worried. How do you study animal if you don't see it? This was my last evening. Uh, my guide was about a 15 year old boy from the local village. So we were walking and about 100 meters out of the bush, four lions came. And I had never seen a large cat on foot like this. And I didn't know what to do. So I asked him, kya karna? And he just put finger like that. So I said, I kept quiet. I held my breath, stood still. And they, these lines kept coming. And I kept looking at him. And he was not flustered at all. Then I realized I had a camera, binoculars, and I should kind of use them. And by the time I focused, three of those lines had disappeared. I got the shot. Took me about six months to do this. Get up real close. And the only reason we have to do this is to be able to identify these animals. You can look at how dense the vegetation is. You can have the most powerful binoculars or telescope or camera. But if you are more than 10, 15 meters away from the animal, all you will get is a screen of vegetation. Unlike leopards or tigers, lions don't have markings. So you really need to be looking at what are called as vibrisse spot patterns, whisker spot patterns. There are four lines of these. And these spots are located uniquely like our fingerprints. And that's the reason one had to get so close to it. This is a subadult radio-collared male sleeping. 
in a hot summer day. I crept up, took this picture and look at his reaction of curiosity, not of aggression. So these are very, very special animals. These are wild animals. They are very special animals. I'm not saying they recognized me. I didn't keep names for them. I didn't call them Jimmy or anything like that. And you could also do that. And that's my own shadow. This is a wide angle picture of a male lion sleeping. I mean, this is not something you just don't walk up and do this. This took about two hours to kind of figure it out slowly, creep up, creep up, creep up. Don't ask me why I did it. This is what conservation really is about India. This is in the middle of the national park. You have a public transport bus. You have wild lions walking. I mean, are we going to set aside real habitat for wildlife? Are we going to allow all of it for humans? These are questions we need to think about. I never get tired about talking about lions because most Indians don't know about lions, don't appreciate lions. And very often from the audience at the end of the talk, they'll talk, oh, by the way, what did the tiger do? Not realizing we are actually talking about lions. I think these lions are special. I think they deserve your attention. I think they deserve your support. Please think about it. And gear is not just about lions, leopards, or other forms of life. It's about wonderful landscapes, brilliant sunrises and sunsets. Thank you very much. I ask Mahati to answer. So I think that was a fantastic talk. And um, I think I'm fairly new to the, uh, I am fairly new to ecology of lions uh, myself. So, uh, and I think that might actually hold true for a lot of people. We've all sort of heard of lions and gear and all of that vaguely. Um, but, uh, and I hope that me being here, maybe I can uh, actually engage with you on um, specific questions and um, other things based on my experience in addition to uh, my exposure to whatever I've heard about lions. So, one of the things that we talked about was the canine distemper virus and um, we and the major issue with uh, CDV, the major issue with having all your lines in one basket or all your lines at give is uh, the fact that anything from floods to uh, viral infections could potentially wipe out the population. And uh, CDV is something that from Serengeti and from the 2018 experience, we clearly know that that is a potential risk. And uh, in 2018, so there are newspaper reports and different sources which talk about how uh, India imported vaccines from uh, the United States to basically vaccinate the lions against CDV to address the issue by quarantining them, testing them, and vaccinating them. And this I think a lot of experts have raised the question of whether we should be vaccinating wild animals and uh, whether that's the right way to go forward. And four years down now, uh, India is investing in uh, trying to have a, a vaccine that is made in India for uh, vaccinating lions against CDB. And um, this goes against the uh, expert advice of typically perhaps uh, trying to identify the sources of uh, CDV around um, the uh, habitat of the lions and trying to vaccinate those um, dogs or other sources that may persist. And from your perspective, how do you view this? Um, how do you think India should be going forward with this? And do you think they will actually take it? No, it's great that India is developing its own vaccine. Uh, that gives us a certain level of freedom and so on and so forth. But it is almost impossible to vaccinate wild animals, especially when it, when it requires a booster. It's not a single dose. You need to boost it in a few months. And then every few years, you again need to vaccinate. So the logistics of doing that is unachievable. Whether do you want wild animals or do you want each of these animals in a cage? What is it that you want? We need to be clear about this. Second, how much do you want to interfere with nature? Diseases are in some sense part of nature. The problem is that we've interfered so much. So we really need to, as you said, focus on the interference rather than an intervention like this. In October of 2018, 
a group of some 30 odd lions were captured saying we will observe them and those lions are still in captivity. So the minute you take wild animals off their location, nature doesn't like vacuum. Other animals would move in and that territory is gone. So, I mean, ecology needs to be part of decision making. And unfortunately, it was a knee-jerk reaction. They were worried about bad press. They were seen to, wanted to be seen to be taking action. So, um, and from my understanding, CDV is also a larger issue, mainly in terms of lions being social animals. Is that right? So, um, so when we are talking about tigers or any other wildcat, including the cheetah, they are equally, okay, equally is incorrect here because they're not social, but they potentially could, or they do get CDV Absolutely. and die. Absolutely. Uh, uh -huh. Tigers have, in India, tigers have got CDV. So, um, the next question that I'd uh, like to bring in is, um, since we are talking about relocation effect, uh, efforts and uh, the fact that Kuno was actually identified as a key site and the first choice for relocation, the Gujarat government clearly does not seem uh, very interested in this relocation. Um, there have been discussions about um, the relocation of lion populations within Gujarat itself and um, discussions on how f um, appropriate habitat is. So could you t tell us? Well, first of all, the term to use is translocation and reintroduction. Translocation is when you move wild animals from one wild location to a, another wild location and reintroduction is when you move it into former range. Kuno used to have lines before. Within Gujarat, they've been, I've been hearing this from the 1960s. 60s as on publication and definitely from the 80s from my own memory. If Gujarat had its habitat, what has prevented them from translocating and reintroducing lions across 60 years now? And just because they do it in Gujarat should not prevent us from doing it elsewhere. And as I keep saying, what is the value of the 2013 judgment if it is not implemented? It was appealed against and the appeal was dismissed. So the current rule of law, the law of the land is, lines need to be translocated to Kuno. However, there are a lot of um, appeals against the judgment which basically bring into picture uh, the fact that Kuno is a um, a tiger corridor so, um, and tiger lion conflicts could potentially end badly for lions. Uh, Why do you think so? Uh, it could bend, end equally badly for tigers. So, um, But the fact is, I showed you a map of the past distribution of lions. Lions and tigers and leopards had overlapping distribution. As much as people on horseback went from Red Fort to hunt lions, people in a single day have also hunted tigers and lions in the 1800s. What does that tell you? How far can you move? So typically, the wetter, denser, more undulating habitat in a landscape would be tiger country. The drier, more open, flatter habitat would be lion country. So there is absolutely no ecological truth or historical truth in saying that lions and tigers do not overlap. Okay. Um, and so as per the 72 judgment, the uh, uh, tiger basically replaced the lion as the national animal and there have been a couple of people who uh, supported uh, bringing back the lion as the national animal and uh, how do you think this, uh, the position of the lion as a national animal would have made the situation any different from what it is today? Well, I doubt that. I mean, you still see all kinds of development taking place in tiger reserves. I mean, the logic, as I said, was tigers are found in larger part of India than lions. The reason the lions ob obviously became the national animal after independence is because it's part of our Ashoka uh, em emblem, the national emblem, right? So that's how the lions probably became uh, the national animal. It was not a judgment. It was a decision of the National Wildlife Board uh, in 1971, I think, to... In, and in 72, tigers replaced the lion. I don't think it would have made any difference. I mean, you could argue that being the national animal, it should be found in other places than Gujarat. But there, you have a standing order of the Supreme Court. So I don't think this would make any difference. So now, as of present, the introduction of cheetahs to Kuno 
has complicated the issue in multiple terms. Do you think um, if the question were to, uh, if we were to bring up the question as to whether lions to, should still be translocated, uh, reintroduced to Kuno, um, in terms of the available prey um, in Kuno, do you think they should still go forward? I don't think prey is a problem. Okay. The challenge is that cheetahs are so low down the power hierarchy of large cats that they fear that a lion in the same habitat as cheetah before the cheetah population is settled would upset their plans because lions could very easily uh, kill cheetahs, especially the cubs. That, that really is because the action plan says lion introduction can be considered after the cheetah population has established itself. And how much long it will take, time it will take, 15 years. The, in a best case scenario, the cheetah population is expected to settle down, established in 15 years. But the 2013 judgment said translocate in six months. So, uh, given that being the case, how do you think, um, or what should be done to take this case forward? Somebody has to go to court again. I don't know whether the court will take action, but the fact of the matter is, the cheetah introduction plan is bad in so many other ways. Okay. Cheetahs exist in density of 1 per 100 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. Kuno is 748 square kilometers. So how many cheetahs are going to be there? So we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. Mm -hmm. I will continue to advocate for lions. I'll continue to advocate for rule of law. I hope some of you will see that logic and reason in what I'm saying. We'll get to you just in a minute. Um, so as part of community conservation efforts, so there have been 24 villages that have been relocated uh, in Kono under the promise of bringing lions right. there and a lot of them have also been hopeful about it assisting their economy uh, by providing job opportunities and uh, other such opportunities. What has been the case with the 24 villages and um, there is probably distrust in government judgments at this point. Um, so uh, how have they been impacted? Well, uh, interestingly, the Maharaja, the ex-Maharaja of Palpur, which is the center of Kuno, um, went to court recently saying, I gave my land for lions. I did not give my land for cheetahs. The lions haven't come, but you're bringing cheetahs. So the Maharaja himself is in distress. So you can well imagine what uh, the feeling of the uh, villagers are. The villagers have been disappointed. Uh, even though we tried our best, we increased the package value by 100% in 95 when it started rolling out. We also made sure a family was, every 18 year old and above was considered a family unit rather than just a typical. Uh, but what happened was they didn't give cultivable land. They dispersed communities. So two adjoining villages didn't get adjoining land. They were in different areas. Then something to do with governance. They were panchayats, but they didn't have that role when they moved out. They moved into, a dominant caste area and then you know how caste politics were. So all kind of problems. The problem with our relocation resettlement policy is we also deal with human lives as pieces of paper. They become a file moving exercise rather than an investment in people's life exercise. And if you think 24 villages is a problem, the Cheetah Project wants to relocate 169 villages. Good luck to them. So following similar lines, um, around Gil, since a significant population of lions in Gil presently live outside protected areas, um, how is the community impacted? How, uh, what are the community conservation um, initiatives that are taken up by different stakeholders? It's varied. We see some horrendous videos on, um, on whatever, internet, WhatsApp. I mean, there was one where somebody was teasing a lioness with a chicken. Um, there was, uh, there have been instances when people have stopped their motorcycles and wanted to take selfies and paid the price for it. You know, a lion is sleeping by the road, he stopped his motorcycle, he gets down and he thinks he's a, whatever, Tarzan or whatever, goes and takes a selfie and that lion wakes up and there's a, there's a problem there. So it's very varied. Most people at one level are afraid, as you should be. I mean, a lion in your backyard is not a nice thing to have. And especially if you have cattle in, within your uh, homestead, in villages, you know how it is. And they, they are 
going after the cattle, so you're living barely 10 feet away. And there's a lion, there's a cattle, and there's chaos. And all of this is happening at night. You might have power, you might not have power. So it's not the best of situations. God forbid a lion dies in your property. Then you have to prove you're innocent. It's not as if the government has to prove you are guilty because it's a Schedule 1 animal. So it's, it's not easy. People are losing livestock, people. And in Gujarat sometimes, power comes only at night. If you have to irrigate, you have to go to your field, you have to switch on your pump, you're going to encounter lions. So there's all kinds of challenges. But at the same time, um, there has to be some form of local uh, conservation effort or the locals actually appreciating their presence because uh, then there's otherwise there's no uh, reason for them to coexist, right? So, um, lions are reasonably well behaved. They don't necessarily attack people all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the question to ask is why so few people are attacked? I mean, if it was, I mean, actually with leopards also that's the question to ask. I mean, you have leopards living in and outskirts of Bangalore, Bombay. So it's quite remarkable that large cats in India. But for exceptions, I mean, there are certain pockets where leopards and tigers cause a problem. In general, the level of attacks, given the number of interactions, is so low. It's quite remarkable. I don't know what the magic is, whether the cats have learned something or whether the people are doing something. Right. So before we maybe open out for questions from the audience, um, just as a closing question, um, how do you see uh, youngsters and other members of the general public from across the country who may have never seen a lion in their life or the people who've probably never heard of lions even uh, existing in India. Um, how do you see them actually engaging with the issue and contributing to um, the issue actually uh, gaining awareness and um, perhaps the lions actually being uh, translocated to Kuno? First and foremost, find out for yourself. Educate yourself. I mean, don't depend on what I'm saying. There are multiple sources today to educate yourself. Second, make it as much common conversation as we talk about cricket and Bollywood and whatever else. Show some interest, invest some time, invest some effort. We still are a democracy. Make representations to the Ministry of Environment, to the Prime Minister's Office, to the Chief Justice of India. Why is the 2013 judgment not? But it should not be a form letter, it should not be a letter in which hundreds of people sign. I think each of us need to make that effort. And I think that can move the needle. Hey, just one question. You had talked about before Kuno, you had identified multiple other sites. Is there a next best site that... We surveyed three sites. Uh, Sita Mata, Dara, Jawar, Sagar, all uh, both in Rajasthan. And Kuno in Madhya Pradesh. Sita Mata... After several weeks of surveying, we found one prey animal. So clearly that is, it's a great habitat, no prey. From where? Which, which habitat is surplusing prey? How much, how many dozens of prey are you going to get? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, ecology doesn't allow explosion like that, right? I mean, these are not bacteria viruses. These are large mammals who have a gestation period, who have a growth phase. And... Again, why are we considering alternatives when there is a 2013 Supreme Court order? I want to continue from your last question, which is very relevant. You took this more out of passion in 1985 and took it as a career later on, if my understanding is correct. How many of the students now would like to look at wildlife as a career option today? That is one. A lot more than when I was. I mean, today, especially women. They'll lot more youngsters and this is not just doing field work, it could be communication, it could be education, I mean multiple ways of writing about it, photography and in some sense all of us need to have all these skills to be able to be effective. Also the education courses have exploded. When I got to do my MSc, there was just one college in all of India offering an MSc in wildlife biology. Today there are at least half a dozen. I think the audience who may not know, he was actually a very good cricketer in college. Had he continued cricket, he would have played for India, but he chose wildlife. Anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Ravi, if I may take you up on that point that you made, very valid point about the importance of respecting the rule of law, which I completely understand. And as somebody who provided the inputs that shaped the 2013 judgment, I know where we stand. We, we, we know where you stand. So, I, I, if you noticed, even with the cheetah, uh, what do you call it? What is the technical term? In introduction. Introduction. Uh, there's been concept, uh, concept, uh, conservation movement has been sort of divided. There have been there are uh, eminent conservationists, right, who have welcomed the idea. Would you, would you consider that? I would like to know their names. Okay. I, um, mm -hmm. I can't recall the names top of the head, but from some of the articles that I've read, I thought they were… Just Venki on this. The proponents of the project sing the praise of the project. Those not involved with the project are all unanimous that this is a bad idea. Okay. So, they are all invested in the project is what you say. Is there… Is there… Um, what is the best case argument, if you want to step outside of your, yourself, what is the best case argument that you can make against the translocation of new lines into, into What is the best argument you can make, if you can step outside of yourself? I mean, you put me in a very difficult position because this is not something that I've ever thought about. The only best case argument is to go with the way Gujarat is a bench. Go, oh, these are my family. How can family members be sent out of Gujarat? So there isn't a... I can't think of any... And, and this is still rule of law. I mean, it, the judgment stands. They only dismissed the contempt petition. They didn't overrule their 2013 order. Can I answer that first? Uh, I mean, these are not matches we stage. Uh, typically, they will avoid each other. So, there will not be a contest. That's a lot of speculation. Pa. You'll have to write some algorithm and figure it. They, when, it depends on what you mean by coexist. Do they live in the same room? The answer is no. Do they live in the same building? Maybe not. Do they live in the same colony? The answer is yes. Second question is, here is a national park. Does the state influence the movement? Should it not be the center? No. Uh, the national park is a stricter form of protection. Gir is not only a national park. The central 250 odd square kilometers is a national park. The surrounding 1200 square kilometers is a wildlife sanctuary. So it's a combination of a national park and a wildlife sanctuary. Management is always the center. I mean, the state. It's the declaration of a national park where the center's approval is required. Hello, sir. Uh, this yeah, is… Yeah, yeah. This side, I'm told, democracy. This is Komal. I'm from the Times of India. Uh, sir, you… Like, all of us are discussing this translocation of uh, lions from Gujarat. Uh, while some were suggesting that that could be another uh, alternative. Uh, my question to you is that uh, now the cheetahs are coming. They have come. Okay. So, there is no… I don't know whether uh, the government is going to change this policy. How much ever there is protest, noise around it, they are coming. We know it for sure. So now what is the next step? Like, why we can keep talking about the 2013 judgment. However, what is the other best way forward or what are the other uh, solutions that experts are looking at? Like where are the, uh, which are the locations across the country? Because lions can obviously survive anywhere, right? Like like you said, the prey is the only thing and their habitat. So is there no other location that has enough prey and enough habitat for the lions? The second question is about, you were talking about some uh, lions taken into captivity and they have not yet been released. I would want to know a little more about that. Thank you. The second question is easier. What exactly do you want to know? For observation. Canine distemper virus, what it is doing, going to do to them when we vaccinate, what happens, those kind of things. RTI? What does RTI have to do with this? So, as in, uh, what about, you know, uh, the experts or whatever noise? Experts are not involved in any of this. It's a decision of the State Forest Department. So, the right person to ask these questions is the Chief Wildlife Warden of Gujarat. I can only tell you things I know from the press. As far as the first question is concerned, it was after much deliberation and work that Kuno was chosen. Why we did not choose the other two sites? I was responding to the earlier question. Sita Mata did not have prey. The average width of Dara Javar Sagar is 10 kilometers. 
So you drop even in the center, a line moves in one direction, five kilometers is outside the park. So the shape of the place was not good. Are there other sites? Very doubtful. Because you're talking of hundreds, if not a couple of thousand square kilometers of habitat. These are not safari parks. You want wild, free-ranging population, right? India is a large country, but still suitable lion habitat is not found everywhere. Suitable habitat of required extent is not found everywhere. An extent with prey is another complication. So the answer is, at this point of time, I cannot think of any other site for translocation of lions. Wildlife tourism is still evolving in India. Do you think, uh, as it evolved, do you think uh, wildlife tourism is a boon or bane for uh, conservation efforts? Tourism is a commercial operation. It's a business. Typically, most entrepreneurs will more focus on their financial balance sheet than other aspects of their business. I would like to be convinced that businesses put other considerations than earnings. Once I'm convinced, I can give a wholehearted support for that kind of intervention. Not only is there a business angle to it, there's also a human rights angle to it. We say forest dwellers, local communities are a problem for the forest. We move them out. But then if you can pay 10,000 rupees a day or whatever you pay, you are allowed access to the same forest. And that's, that's a huge moral question there. And these people obviously will come in vehicles. They're going to fly in. So the carbon footprint of their life, and they want AC, they want a comfortable life. And these poor people are doing everything with such a low carbon footprint. I think at some level, um, when... Um, wildlife tourism is implemented properly, it is actually a bone because you have uh, community involvement of uh, the locals and they gain out of it and it, it pays them back in some way. Uh, Colombia has cases where this oh, has been uh, implemented very oh. well and this has actually been a success story in Colombia in some places. Um, but also I think I think uh, asking people to at any point step up and say, hey, conserve lions because they exist is not going to happen. I think at some level it is important that people are aware of what exists. Uh, there is some amount of, perhaps tourism is not the right way to put it, but some amount of awareness that has to be implemented in terms of first-hand experience that people have with wildlife to actually tell them, hey, this is happening. If they have that emotional connection to that place or to that uh, creature, it's more likely for them to actually step up um, for the cause. No, excellent point. I think whatever you see, some pictures, videos, it's not like smelling the place and feeling the place in your bones. First of all, I would like to compliment for a very good presentation. There were a few uh, new things I learned. Now, my, there are two many questions, rather I would restrict to two, okay, they are only general questions. The first one is, you said you are putting a radio collar for tracking, okay, like we also do in engineering for so many things. But uh, do, will you leave it as it is till, till the end of their life or uh, at some point in time you will remove them? There are two ways of do, looking at it. One is once your research is done, it's part of your responsibility to remove the oh, collar. Yes. But you can't ask the lion to come and remove the collar, <laughs> which means it involves tranquilization. With each tranquilization and capture, there's an element of risk. Yes, yeah. So you'll have to weigh the risks again, okay. whether it's riskier, it's worse off for the animal to carry the collar, or is it worse off to capture it again? It's like removing the bone from the body after the surgery. Second question is, I saw some of the pictures, uh, the people are very close. In this modern age, is there not a safety measure or is, is it still like that or uh, is it, uh, are, is, are there any uh, risk avoiding, you know, methods or equipments uh, to do this kind of research? Maybe th that was towards the end? Uh, I saw some of them are too close, like I think I saw in one of the photographs you were, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, is it uh, that risky to, I mean, unless otherwise people are really determined, no, people it will not attract. So, is there a way of avoiding this? Today we talk about uh, employment, health and safety in organization, we take so many measures. Like that, there must be a science. 
in the wildlife also so I'm yes absolutely that is called reading the animal's behavior okay you understand the animal first you don't i mean on day one you don't go up to it correct okay you watch it you observe it you figure out how these animals behave and like all of us lions also have good days and bad days i mean yesterday i might have observed a lion at close quarters it is fine but that tomorrow i go and i step 100 meters away and i can either see the tail shake or a roar rumbling so these are the early warnings that you take no animal is asking you to come close to it no animal is asking you to walk in its habitat but certain kind of research can only be done by this i have been charged roughly about 25 times mm. at no point of time other than once did i feel threatened why do animals charge just like us even at home suddenly giving a flippant reply or lashing out at your spouse or whatever you know these kind of things happen that's their way of saying get out of my life now i mean they are not charging to kill they are charging to let you know that they are not happy in fact the bigger threat to indians is from snake bites mm -hmm. more people get killed by snake bites than by large cats in this country and it's much more dangerous to work with animals like rhinos and elephants than with large cats one final question um and see this uh, uh, i have seen many whatsapp videos where you know the humans the lion get up on them and see i don't know really, really photoshopped as real is it possible to you know do like this i mean i mean i ungal enna sir vai irukum enak 62 sir yeah vai sir ama circus la paathirpa illaya enna pannindathu lion how do they domesticate at least in circus these are not wild sir uh. the videos that you see are of lions which have been brought up as cubs like your cat domestic cat or something like that they make it look wild these are not wild animals no self respecting wild cat will do that and that's what i was because will they will they not uh, you know remember their natural instinct i mean no, even no, no. natural instinct is not to attack you okay. that's also you should understand okay the natural instinct is not to attack you natural instinct is to put distance between human beings and themselves okay it is only when they are cornered they do not have an option they are going to attack okay. there is of course a very very small percentage where animals attack deliberately but that's so small that i can't even put a number to it okay thank you sir thank you uh, is there any best practices on conservation that we can learn from other countries like obviously even african lions are disappearing at a very fast pace recently i think in 2019 there was a report saying that they have gone 50% of what they were 25 years ago so is there anything that we can learn or uh, you know uh, imbibe from other countries the only way you can survive is by learning in all fields so in conservation also you have to learn science is universal conservation also is universal but what you have to be very careful never adopt a model of conservation without thinking it through what works in meghalaya does not work in maharashtra so from africa is definitely not going to work in india unless you know what you are doing and that's my problem with cheetahs okay so let's so take last i i i beg to you know be a spoiler here we could go on and on and on but keeping time in you i think he ravi is available for one on one conversation so we'll continue the conversation So thank you very much and before we give a big round of applause to both of them a special applause for Mahati she has come so well prepared and the way she has conducted the conversation i think she really uh deserves all our applause well done Ravi of course has uh, reached out to each one of us earlier i was also you know one cat was the same as the other i am reminded of the my first posting some wild cat attacked some villagers so me and the forest officer went around with a big book asking the villager attack panna cat und stripe irundada illa pulli irundada that fellow said na i was running for my life and you want to know what it was whether it was striped or and there was also this this place where a pug mark was you know garlanded and there was a uduvatti around it and people so that reminded me that lady doing puja so this was what most of us in chennai at least 
we know one cat, the other cat, they are all different cats, that's all for us and thank you for giving us an insight into their lives. I didn't know that it was pride was there but the other one was a coalition. I had never heard the word coalition. Thank you. Thank you for shedding so much light on the lives of the big cats, the lions and uh, for taking the effort to come down from Bangalore. I'm sorry today is the attendance is a little bit on the lower side. Golu, Navaratri, so what, what have you. So we meet again next week. We have another discussion on a very interesting topic which is North versus South. I think we have the author here and uh, this is a data driven kind of a discussion which we'll have. So I hope all of you turn up for that. And uh, we do have a number of other events also planned after that. In fact, uh, we are going to have three uh, foreign secretaries, ex-foreign secretaries and ambassadors coming here to address us on the world situation. That is later next month. So we hope all of you do turn up for these events and encourage us in our efforts to bring quality uh, events like this to Chennai. Thank you very much and a special thanks to Ravi and Mahati for this wonderful event. Thank you.